This is The Blockchain Show. The Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies and promotes widespread adoption of cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. This week on the show, we have Kevin Hobbs of Van Beck's group and Ether Party. Ledger Wallet is a smart card based Bitcoin hardware wallet bringing maximum protection level to your Bitcoins without sacrificing usability or control. Find the link in this episode's show notes. Hey, Stephen, thanks so much for, for having me here. Happy to be on. So I'm the CEO of the Vanbex Group and Ether Party. Uh, the Vanbex Group is a professional services and development company that specializes in the blockchain space. We've been around since 2013. Uh, we've worked with over 50 uh, mentionable companies in this space, doing everything from grassroots marketing to content, branding, um, and everything in between, up to building the tokens, crowdfunding contracts, and everything blockchain. And then Ether Party, um, some of you might have heard about it already. It's uh, We just unveiled it in London at a couple of conferences out there. It's the smart contract wizard that sits on top of Ethereum that allows anybody to create smart contracts. You don't have to be a programmer or coder to do so. There's a, there's a pretty funny like YouTube video on your website <laughs> of, of Bernie Sanders saying, like, I'll tell you about the 1%. <laughs> yeah. The one yeah. percent can't can only write smart contracts, and the ninety nine percent of people need to write smart contracts. <laughs> yeah, we we thought that was pretty funny because it, it kind of fits. Bernie Sanders always talks about about the one percent, and we are always trying to hire great like Solidity developers, blockchain developers. And someone told me one time, he's like, "Do you realize that only like the top one percent of people can even code in this?" And that's kind of where that that video. Kind of came from, uh, and plus the fact that you know we built Ether Party so that you didn't have to be part of that one percent to create smart contracts. Yeah, it's got to be like point oh 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 one percent though. And yeah, you know, no. There might be what <laughs> two hundred tops good uh, Solidity developers. Four. Yeah. I know. I, and you know what? I have to say that we're really fortunate. Our dev team that we've built in-house now over the last little while, I mean, they're amazing. Some of the stuff that they're doing, like, it's way over my head. And and these guys are absolutely awesome. I would put them up against any team in the space. They're that good. Um, so we're really fortunate to have them in-house. Because they, they are... Oh, sorry. They should have, like, fights between different dev teams and, you know... Yeah, um, one of our one of our guys actually, and I'm waiting to see how he did. He just uh, participated in a hackathon down in Atlanta, and he's actually been teaching courses up here at the University of British Columbia in uh, in Ethereum and Solidity development. There's uh, not too many uh, colleges that is it that teach uh, Solidity, so that's no. Cool. Yeah, no. Um, the University of British Columbia has now actually a whole blockchain curriculum called Blockchain at UBC, and we're one of their main partners. We're actually um, involved in a bunch of research projects with them uh, based on blockchain. <clears throat> what, uh, what's the interest as far as, you know, college goes in, in blockchain at UBC? What, what, what's, what's cooper cooperative efforts do you have going with them? So we have uh, we actually have a, a government grant to um, create two six month research projects where they give us kind of um, like fourth year students, uh, computer science students that have uh, are looking to learn how to build blockchain products and do the research. Mm -hmm. Up there, the interest has been growing. When it first started, I think they started with like five members, and and now they've got like a full house, and they're expanding. Um, Victoria Lemieux up there at uh, the University of British Columbia is building an entire consortium um, in British Columbia based around blockchain. So it, it's been really growing. I have to say that Vancouver is turning into somewhat of a, a blockchain hub. Um, in Canada, it's not as far advanced as, as Toronto is yet, but it's really growing. Is that just because of the regulatory environment in Canada makes it a way better place than the United States, or is there something in the water, in the snow? Uh, 
Um, well, I think – so Vancouver itself uh, used to be like a big kind of mining space. And now all the mining people, since that slowed down, are looking into tech. But it, it's funny that you mentioned the regulatory environment. Yeah, I do believe that uh, Canada is one of the safest places to kind of have a blockchain company. And if you're going to raise money in like an ICO, I, it's it's becoming a good place to, to be. Actually, tomorrow I have a meeting with the um, British Columbia Securities Commission to learn um, from – about ICOs and everything there. They're looking at making it a, a safe environment. Yeah, um, the ICOs are, are pretty strange because on one hand, I think people should be free to invest their money how they choose. On the other hand, I think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money on some of the real shady ICOs that are out there that really, eh, there's not really a product. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's literally a web page that a halfway decent developer can put up in a day or two. And millions of dollars uh, get get sent to them, and and with the price of Ethereum going up, typically they're on Ethereum. You know they have hundreds of millions of dollars at their disposal. How, how do you keep a team motivated? Um, so I'm, I'm I'm I think that you know people should be allowed to spend their money however they, they choose to, but I also know that it's going to. You know, some people are going to come out on on the on the wrong end of the uh, investment opportunity by some of these uh, pretty bad ICOs. What, what's your what's your? Do you agree with me? Disagree? Uh, I definitely agree with a lot of that, 100%. There, there needs to be uh, more regulation and proper due diligence done on projects, and we're actually working super hard um, to kind of kind of bring those standards to the table when it comes to ICOs because we do do so many of them, and we work with so many projects. So, I mean, we need to come up with, with global standards because ICOs are what we want to be a global fundraise. So... We put kind of tokens into three buckets right now. We've been talking to a lot of like governments and, and regulatory bodies that kind of agree. Mm -hmm. The first one is like a, a utility token, kind of like Ethereum. So it gives you access to use the platform in some way, shape, or form. Even on that, you still need to have some sort of protection, like consumer protection. Um, and then the second second bucket is is kind of like a debt instrument or a loan. And that this one, you need to have even more stringent regulation uh, around this to make it a kind of like a full security token and like equity, profit sharing, and dividends. And this one we need to treat like a traditional security. But what ICOs do is they open it up to like a non-jurisdictional raise. And, and that's really good for companies to be able to get um, the funds that they need because especially in new industry um, like blockchain, it's going to cost probably three times as much to get a product into the mainstream and actually making money than it would for a product in, in something like social media or you know an app or something like that that people are used to. Um, again, though, you also need to make sure that you're taking care of your investors. ICOs tend to be, though, much more safe than regular investing um, because you have instant liquidity, which you don't have in like a traditional VC model. So a traditional VC model, you know, it's almost a 90% failure rate. They invest in 10 companies, only one gets successful. So that itself is almost like a failing model, which is why ICOs are coming to the forefront. And you're seeing a lot of VCs. We talk to tons of VCs that want to get into the ICO space, learn more, and figure out what's the best way for them to invest so it is evolving but we we have a lot of work to do yeah i would definitely agree with uh well, you know almost all of those points uh, i i worry because it's it seems like it's a great opportunity for over regulation just you know trying to get the governments involved and i guess there was an ic you know the the sec uh just ruled on the dow saying that it was a security. And I think anybody at the time knew that it was a security. There wasn't anybody out there saying, oh, this isn't a security. They were all saying, like, well, what are they going to do? Who are they going to sue? It's a completely, like, decentralized organization, or at least that was what they were saying. Well, was there any ability for the SEC to go after any individuals or companies in, in that type of uh, – in, specifically in the Dow, not in any of the ICOs that, that are around today? 
I mean, if they wanted to, specifically in the Dow, yeah, there's multiple companies that they could go after if they wanted to. But I think what the SEC was really trying to do, um, because I, from what we hear and what we're talking about, I don't think that these regulators uh, that want to kill this industry. They don't want to kill ICOs. They want to understand it and work with it. Um, so the Dow was a great example of the SEC coming out and saying, hey, Here's some guidelines. You know, take a look at this. This is what is in our um, line of thinking, which I think is great because once once regulation comes into this market, the ICO market is going to go from a multi-million dollar market to a multi-billion dollar market, just like what would happen with gaming and regulation. So I, I think it's needed, and I'm, I'm glad that they kind of came out with that. But, yeah, there, I don't really want to name the companies, but there are some companies that could definitely be on the hook um, for, the, for the Dow for sure. Um, but I'm glad the SEC decided not to go get them. I mean, Slocket, the, the, the Swiss bank that was trying to uh... – Anyways, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> we, I'm happy, but yeah, you're, you're talking about them. I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm really for this space. Like our, our mission statement at Vanbex and everything is to further the education and adoption of this technology. Yeah. So, you know, any anybody that's really coming in the space and trying to do something good, I want to support. I don't really want to hinder. Like the DAO was, was obviously a failed attempt. It could have been done a lot better. But at least now we know what we can improve on. Right. So like with uh, like our product, Ether Party, we're doing an ICO for this and we've worked really hard with our legal group in uh, in Canada and in Switzerland to put together what, what they're calling is like the gold standard of terms and conditions. We're doing a, a SAFT note, which is a simple agreement for future tokens, all legally binding, proper corporate legal structure. But even even more on the on the technical side of things, what we did is we built a product that works before coming out and trying to raise money. We built like an MVP, a minimum viable product that we can showcase, that we've already been showcasing, that basically says, hey, you know, putting up a website and writing a white paper, you know, that's not good enough. You need to be better if you're going to come into this space and raise some money. You know, what are the ICOs that actually have an MVP besides yourself? Um... That's that's a good one. I don't know of too many that actually have a working product in this space. Um, yeah, I had somebody talk a little bit about Aragon, um, and they they said it was you know still early. I mean, every I, everybody keeps using the word nascent or nascent technology. It's yeah. all it's all new here. I think Swarm City has some sort of app here. Um, yeah. we had them on, but I can't think of Golem or Golem still beta, or do do they have something? I think they're still beta. Yeah, I think maybe First Blood released something, which I, I think that's about it. That's all the only ones I can think yeah. of. There might be more. We work, we work with First Blood back on their sale and stuff like that. Okay. Um, good team, good team, good group there. But yeah, they, there's a lot of companies that don't. And you know, we haven't done a lot of promotion or anything for Ether Party. We actually released our first first version back in 2015, but it was a little clunky. So we went back to the to basically the drawing board and we we built something better and. <clears throat> In London, I unveiled and did live demos of how to create a ERC-20 token, a crowdfunding contract, a watch contract, and a full ICO and ICO page, and then deploy it on the blockchain um, and did that with uh, in, in under three minutes. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I, how does it compare to, like, WYSIWYG editors of the, of the early web? I always, you know, they were uh, always such a cool idea, but then you actually try to use it. And it was really, really difficult to, to, to use them. I think now maybe Wix is the most popular one. And yeah. it's better, but it's still, you know, in order to really get the full experience or in order to do things really right, you have to be kind of a developer. Or, or is it, or, or does Smart Contract completely different where you can, you know, have these sort of uh, uh, things like uh, Ether Party and, and it's really intuitive and, you know, you really get a good result for, for, the, for what you're able to do? Mm -hmm. So Wix and these WYSIWYG technologies is kind of somewhat what we've we've based a little bit on how it is, but it is expanded. A smart contract, you know, is something that I think needs um, a technology like this to get into the mainstream. So first kind of adopters for a smart contract are going to be people like lawyers, supply chain management. Um, in our industry, people who want to create tokens. And what I think is a lot safer is to have a, a platform <clears throat> that automatically updates to the safest technology, almost like a software update, that 
can do things for you so that you're not having the problems that we're seeing with a lot of ICOs where they're being hacked, um, you know, like CoinDash does, just got hacked or, you know, the parity wallets and stuff just got hacked. I, I mean, I think you want to put your trust into a, an established company that builds great products that are, are super secure uh, to do these things. So we're, we're working with a lot of legal firms that think, hey, this is going to be great. Legally binding contracts um, that can hold ex escrow and execute based on the parameters parameters that, that you set automatically. So it takes a lot of work out for, for legal firms. It's a simple audit trail on a blockchain. And you can bring in outside data. So we've proved in, in EtherParty that we can bring in outside data and outside APIs that people choose to execute contracts. So I, I do think it's something that we can give uh, give to the public that they will use in everyday sort of use, and they don't need or want a coder to do because you know all the all the tough smart contract coding and everything happens on the on the back end. And like we mentioned in the beginning, it's like point zero zero one of developers can actually do this. So how many companies can can actually do this? So, but we even we even went one a little bit better with the enterprise API because we're working with some larger. Uh, clients. And so the enterprise API allows a company to kind of upload EtherParty's API, download any documents that they want, and it'll automatically turn it to a, a, into a smart contract. And then they can, they can set their conditionality, their arbiters, their escrow and everything into the contract and then deploy it. Well, what do you mean by download any document and turn it into a smart contract? Like it reads hmm. the legalese and creates a smart contract? Or what do you mean by a document? Yeah. So LegalZoom, a perfect example. They have a lot of legal documents that people can use. Mm -hmm. um, now you can take those documents, download them into EtherParty, and then add things. So think about LegalZoom matched match with DocuSign and an escrow agent. So you have all that in, in one place. You download a document. You add things like an arbiter, whether that's a real person or an API based on information. You put escrow into it. Right now it's digital currency, but eventually um, maybe we can move into to fiat when the technology is there. And then have that have that contract um, automatically e execute based on dates, uh, parameters, uh, milestones, anything you want. You can you can do an employment contract for a developer and connect the API to GitHub and pay him out as you see the proper code commits go through on, on your GitHub. Is anybody using that uh, GitHub developer? Not yet, but that's that's actually why we started building it back in 2015. We wanted to pay our staff <laughs> more efficiently. <laughs> I think there was somebody working on like a Trello thing where it was a smart contract slash Trello. So you, it seems like there's there's like a number of it's it's a very ex expensive uh, project. You have Oracle in, uh, Oracle um, it, connections where you can. Uh, you know, add a data and then query it with the rest of it. You have um, maybe Stablecoin you're working on. Uh, there was a few other like really big uh, projects that that's that you're working on. Is is that is it is it as expansive as as what what I'm understanding, or is it a little more scaled back than that? Um, so EtherParty is a pretty big part, uh, project for us to build out the contract libraries, um, build in the oracles, um, and, con and continue to scale and expand to what people are going to use this every day. It, it is a very, very large project at the end of the day. Yeah, it seems like, I know like Zeppelin OS is doing something where, you know, you can upgrade the contracts. Um, it, I mean, so it's really, so are, are you building, you mentioned that you're building stuff like that where, you know, if there's some sort of security update, you can, uh, you know, do some sort of updatable contracts, and you're always working with the with the most current secure code. Is is that something that uh, that either party does as well? Yes, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. So. Perfect example is um, you guys probably have heard of like the ERC two two three tokens. That is kind of a more um, kind of safe version yeah, why, of the ERC twenty. Why hasn't that caught on? It seems like it's very very. It's not different at all, but everybody still wants to use ERC twenties. So mainly because a lot of wallets and exchanges um, can't really accept ERC two two three as easily yet. But um, so for example, our our with a click of a button. EtherParty can create an ERC-223 token in the same speed that it creates an ERC-20 token. 
Hmm. We already have that implemented in the system. Maybe to ask a question to step back a little bit. There's there's things like counterparty and <laughs> Doge party. Are, are they similar to this in any way, or or oh. just just where did you borrow the name party from? <laughs> Actually, Lisa Chang, uh, our founder, my partner here, she came up with the name back in in 2015, and I'm not sure exactly where she came up with the name. Um, she's she's pretty quirky and funny, so okay. she kind of came up with the name, and it and it just kind of stuck. And now and now people love the name. It's like oh, love either party, but it's it's funny because our lawyers, when they're going through everything for this, they're like, you know, would you guys think about you know changing your name so it speaks to like you know big business and stuff like that? And you know, Lisa was like, no, why would we change our name? <laughs> 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 your group has been around a long time, even working with the. The first ICO. What, what? Now, what was the first the ICO, and then what was the first project that was actually called an ICO? So the first ICO was Mastercoin, uh, which Lisa Lisa used to work for Mastercoin um, before she left to start start Bandex. Um, and it was actually just called a crowd sale for legal terms back then. Yeah, it's so, certainly interesting to 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 think about like. Uh, ICOs and, and how far they come. When 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 Bitcoin you know first came out, I didn't I didn't foresee the the proliferation of different digital assets. I thought, eh, you know, this is really cool um, money, and there'll be maybe different parameters of of different types of money. But pretty quickly, I realized that oh, there's there's a lot more that can be done, um, and it. it it's. I don't. I'm not quite certain what will come next either. I mean, the the, the rate at which uh, technology advances in this space is it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I when I first started um, back in early 2015, at, at first I was super skeptical about this space. Um, I had no idea where it was going to go or what it was going to do. And I actually was like, oh, Bitcoin. Like, I have no idea about Bitcoin. I come from like a traditional finance background in, in trading and foreign exchange. I, had, I was just like, no way. But then as I, I dug deeper into the technology and I, I started to go down that rabbit hole, as they say, yeah. I realized that this, this technology is going to change everything we do with our digital processes and infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, I'm not surprised that the ICOs went the way that it, it is. Back in 2015, we kind of predicted this, and uh, we started to create uh, almost like a consortium of people that can help companies um, raise money via, via ICOs. Because it, it was one of the biggest problems. You, you couldn't get traditional investment in this space because you had new technology, new faces, and untested technology that kind of came from the dark web and no one really knows what's going on. Um, so it's super hard for these, these amazingly smart people to, to get funding for these projects that now we're seeing or people are talking about changing the world. Um, so seeing ICOs evolve um, is, is kind of where it should be, and I only see it getting larger and larger and larger in the future. Do you think an ICO coin will have a market cap larger than you know any of the cryptocurrencies, larger than Bitcoin, larger than Ethereum? It'll be the number one by market cap. ICO coin? Yeah. Well, oh, like yeah. Well, hmm. you know, a coin that was funded by, you know, that that exists on another network. I guess I, you know, I I, I, I struggle with the term ICO because I always think of it as like you know a coin that exists on another network. But I mean, really, you know, Ethereum was an ICO. I guess hmm. um, I, I don't I don't think of it that way. It's a terminology that I gotta kind of grasp it's still people have different no. views of what things are i suppose uh, i might have misspoken no no that, that's fine I, I get people do struggle with the terminology even, especially people who are like not in blockchain like we are all the time so it, whether you call it initial coin offering initial token offering token generating event uh, basically like what a lot of people are using tokens for right now is, is a vehicle to get funding so it, it's just kind of a vehicle to get funding or to, uh, as an application within within their technology or their business model, that really really works. Um, is there anything that is there any terminology that differentiates a coin that exists on top of another network? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know. Most people just call them tokens, digital tokens. Right. Right. Uh, and, and to go back about like one having a larger market cap, so I, I kind of have a different different view. I view Bitcoin um, as really like digital gold and the only real currency on the market. And all the other tokens I kind of see as 
commodities or utilities based on the project that they're in that are all pegged to Bitcoin. So I, I do think that Bitcoin will probably always be the most valuable, but a lot of other ones like Ethereum and other coins to come and who knows will kind of you know move up as their technology gets more adopted into the mainstream and, and those tokens become more and more valuable. It's it's you know interesting. I think about it. You know that you know coin versus a cryptocurrency. There's kind of no difference to me if like Amazon were to come out tomorrow and issue an ERC twenty token on Ethereum. I think it would instantly become you know the, the largest in market cap by far, or Google <laughs> or something like that. It would you know it would just buy it would leapfrog everything else. It, it, it's it's kind of a bad measure uh, market cap as well. I know there was the the yeah. fork recently and now Bitcoin Cash is number three in market cap. So. So market market cap is a, is a little different, I think, in this space because mm-hmm. someone can, can someone can come out and create bazillion tokens and, and price them at something. I, I think more you want to look at the token's individual value as a measure of what the company is worth, and that does go to kind of how many tokens are created, but it's almost like a false sense. And and that's a tough one. Um, I speak with a lot of traditional investors all the time and they're like, how do you justify these valuations? How do you do this? How is it working? And honestly, I I haven't heard a really good answer for it yet. Ripple is is another coin that that has a market cap that may not be, you know, the developers of Ripple still have a a lot of that that's kind of uncirculating. Um, And you're also working on I forget what it was. You're working on an ICO with Ripple, the first ever ICO with Ripple. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, te- a company is called Tech Trader. It's a financial instrument. Um, they also have a company called the World Exchange that um, is going to be doing an ICO on Ripple. So very interesting. We're building out for the first time. Um, actually, Arthur Brittle is a is a friend of of Lisa's, and they were speaking not too long ago. And it's like, hey, you know, you guys do so many ICOs. You have so many companies. What about you know? seeing how ripple works and stuff like that so we're, we're totally open open to, to things like that because we're, we're blockchain agnostic like we believe in the best technology for the job whatever that is um sorry yeah, go ahead no i'm a little conf- i'm a little confused on ripple hopefully maybe you can help clear it up so there's ripple the coin and there's ripple the corporation and I don't know if there's any connection between the two of them. If there is, I think it's kind of tenuous. How, how, how does the coin and the corporation, which one, which one are, you, are you working with? Are you working with the corporation or just on the coin or, so, yeah. J- just, just on the coin and the technology and figuring out how ICOs and stuff would be built and structured on Ripple, what's the best way to go about it, um, things like that. Like it, it's, it's totally brand new. Um, like for us, and so we're building it out and trying to build kind of like best practices around it. Have there been any ICOs other than Bitcoin and Ethereum-based ones? I guess Ethereum Classic might have had one. Um, mm. I guess Bit- does BitShares do ICOs? Probably. Um, I don't know if BitShares has done an ICO that, that we know of. Uh, mm. They must hmm. have. Uh, did, did MasterCoin yeah. do ICOs or Omni? Uh, Omni, Omni does, but that's Bitcoin based. It's Bitcoin. Oh, so Omni's yeah. on Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Omni's a fork of Bitcoin, so um, that's that's still kind of Bitcoin based. I think most of them are pretty much Bitcoin or Ethereum. You have not, what, what confuses me sometimes is is new new blockchains come out and they don't even build their own token. They build like an ERC twenty token to do a, a crowdfund. Um, or another token to a crowdfund instead of issuing tokens on their own, you know, so-called blockchain. That stuff completely confuses me, and I, I don't understand how people get behind that. One. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue. Like, if you have a blockchain and you're saying that your blockchain is going to be better than Ethereum or better than Bitcoin, why aren't you producing your own token and selling your own token on that? You know, I mean, which attached. which which one are you talking about in particular? Oh, there's a few. I mean, Tezos just did that. Oh, yeah. Uh, EOS. Multiple. EOS. Like, so many do these token sales to take advantage of the industry. But they, they, to me, it's like I don't even believe what I'm saying. I don't even trust my own product because I'm not even going to issue a token on my own blockchain. But eventually, you know, you will be able to issue tokens on my product. Yeah. It, like, take, take the time. Develop it out. Prove your theory. You know, why are you making all these promises that obviously you, you can't deliver on because 
you haven't you don't even have the confidence to build your own token on it yet yeah, because i mean I, because somebody's oh, gonna sorry. give you millions of dollars to say so i guess <laughs> yeah yeah i guess <laughs> I, to me, I mean we're, we're in this for the for the for the long run with what we want to do and i mean i believe right now that this blockchain technology it's still not mainstream it's still fragile it can still be broken and you need to have of applications built on top of our two most trusted blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum that speak to the mainstream world, build them something that they're saying, hey, I love this. I can't live without it. This make, makes my life easier. This saves me money. This makes my job so much faster or more efficient. Um, you know, those are the products that once they go live into the mainstream, that it's going to be the, the next phase of the most important applications for this technology and its adoption. Not not building another another blockchain that's going to be better than Bitcoin when technically Bitcoin's not even proven yet. I'm I'm <laughs> stuck on Bitcoin Cash. I know you didn't want to talk about it much. I, I'm no, a, no, that's fine. I'm excited for Bitcoin Cash. I I think the stalemate is great. Uh, Bitcoin or Bitcoin Segwit. Uh, I wasn't really a big fan of. I thought it was you know not a great a great uh, technology. Um, I like Bitcoin Cash. I'm, I'm happy for people who like SegWit. I'm glad that they, you know, have a have a coin that uh, they want. Um, and I'm just excited to to see some progress being made for for both uh, types, both parties that are out there. You know, people who want to see you know large block uh, on chain scaling, and the people who want to have that that uh, second layer. I'm, I'm excited for for both parties, but I, I particularly think it's great that there is a you know, a, a direct um, line for Bitcoin Cash. Well, I have to say I'm probably in an opposite group. Not that I agree or disagree that either technology is better than the other. But if you want to, if you take technology out of this and you want to look at what people outside of blockchain look at, what they see is turmoil. What they see is this, nobody knows what they're doing in this industry. This industry is not proven. They can't even agree on which technology is better. That's what Main Street sees. And I mean, we only really have the Ethereum fork to go by as an example of what happened. And that was a disaster for like a year. So a fork in this industry, a turmoil in this industry that we cannot quantify or say what is, why are we doing this? This is why we're doing it. This is better than X. To anybody on the outside, that that hurts. Like that, that does not help this industry move forward one bit. Um, I talked to a lot of people, a lot of investment firms saying, hey, what's going on with this, this soft work? We're hearing about this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe we better slow down. We're about to invest millions, but now we're going to hold off. And I talk, I talk to firms like this with all the time. They don't understand what's going on within the industry because they're not like in it. They're not in it like we are on a day-to-day -day basis. They only hear about things like, oh, they forked because they can't agree on those problems. And that, that to me is a tough, it is tough um, wanting to move this technology into Main Street. Yeah, there's definitely a, a lot of misunderstanding, uh, you know, outside the, the space as, as well as inside the space. There's a lot of people who don't know, you know, who who may own Bitcoin but don't really, you know, know what a, the difference between a soft fork and a hard fork. And, and you know, but sometimes when there's, you know, uh, parties uh, in, a, in a coin that uh, just have – diametrically opposed positions the only thing you can do is fork there's, there's no there's there's it, it's just how coins are it's just uh, how the market works mm -hmm. i don't know yeah no it is but take take coins out of the equation for a second yeah. and just talk about blockchains and technology then you have to kind of look at at which which blockchain would you use um, to build your technology on top of for a specific use case. And generally, you wouldn't go with a forked one because it's less safe, it's less redundant, it has, it's, it's not proven, there's not really much built on it. So if I, was not, if I didn't care about a coin and I just cared about technology, I'm not going with the one that just forked, I'm going with the one that's been around and it's been proven. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, it's an interesting dilemma because if one has been around long enough and been proven, it seems like... They have also had to fork at one point or another, maybe. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, I, 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 yeah, it's 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 tricky. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I st I think we're still kind of like in dial-up phase right, right now and everybody everybody is trying to get to high speed too quickly and they're forgetting you know what in between high speed and dial-up there's an isdn so let, let's kind of get there first yeah. and, so it's, and, and and maybe that's a fork maybe that is a fork or maybe yeah. it's something that hasn't been developed yet i mean certainly in the business world they, you know do you want to use linux suzy or linux ubuntu 
or mm-hmm. you know key, uh, any of the other variants that are out there are just different forks of the same you know kernel it, it it's it, technology is like that there are forks that's how when that's how when people disagree that's the only way to resolve an issue with um, these type of things yeah no that that's a that's a very good statement very true Ether party definitely sounds very cool I'll, I'll have to I'll have to check it out I haven't had a chance yet did it it just went live too right yeah, we've been very kind of close to the chest with Ether Party. Yeah. So um, by tomorrow, end of day Pacific time, we're going to um, release the white paper to the public. We are going to release a video video dem- demonstration uh, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and we will be announcing the pre-sale, which is which is starting this week. So we're we're doing a public pre-sale, which is a little different because we don't want to exclude the public. It, you do have to have a volume um, of be a volume purchaser to get in on the on the pre-sale. But we have affiliates that we're running that are going to be offering basically communities to come in, and if they reach a certain goal, then they'll be able to offer offer discounts to everybody that that gets in. So we're trying to include the community and be very fair to everyone in in our ICO. You've also you've worked with uh, some of the larger. Uh, you said like fifty ICOs. What are some of the most interesting ones that you've worked with, and um, maybe ones that you personally think are just great technologies? Hmm. Some of the ones that actually we worked with in the early stages are actually much more interesting um, to me, like Factum and things like mm-hmm. that, because. Yeah, because it was at a time when people were, were just wanting to raise money to get their project off the ground, um, and it, there wasn't all these big raises. So, I mean, we helped Factum raise a half a million dollars, which back then was was a big deal, and they've gone on to c- c- raise other money and traditional funding and move forward, whether you like them or not. I like um, them. You know, yeah, so they, they've, they've been successful. And those are the ones that are really interesting, um, like, to me, because, you know, it wasn't in this tulip mania of someone coming out with a white paper and, and a website and raising $100 million. Yeah. You know, you know here's, here, give me $100 million because I'm going to do something 18 months from now, maybe. No, that's so. I, I, those are the ones I, that I really like. Um, I'm sorry, what was what was the question? Some of the interesting technology. Yeah. So I mean, just to maybe back up a little bit. Factum certainly is is interesting. Um, at the time, you said they raised five hundred thousand, which I guess is about what a, uh, a Series A would raise, or I don't really. But say so that about. was that was kind of that was kind of a seed round. Seed round. They did okay. go. So high yeah, seed. I think they. W- they went on to raise. I think their first Series A was four and a half million. Um, after that, and I think they've they've now raised. Uh, I want to say nine, but I think I just heard they raised again, so it might be eighteen million. Um, traditionally, um, so so I mean that that to me is kind of a success. We we helped a company get off the ground, and then they've gone on and proven themselves. Where traditional investors are saying, "Hey, yeah, we like this. We're going to give you money." And then uh, one of the one of the companies that was on our show a few weeks ago, DNN. So if you know, our listeners, if you haven't uh, listened to the DNN show, uh, Decentralized News Network, go ahead, and, go ahead and listen to it. But uh, you worked with DNN? Or you work with DNN? We're still working with DNN. So Sam and Dondre are amazing guys. And they're doing an ICO right. They're, they are going to have a working product before they launch their ICO. These guys are very meticulous, very smart. They've got a great team. Decentralized News Network is going to be a great project. Um, and when they do launch their ICO, I think they're going to be very successful. And, I mean, that this is these are the type of companies that we work with and we kind of help guide. They're like, hey, you know what? We want to do this right. We're going to work with you guys. We're, we're going to build the technology. We're going to do an MVP. We're going to test it. We're going to get in market. We're going to invite the community and everybody. And, and you know what? Then we're going to, going to try to raise money so that we can build more and scale. And they're doing it right, and I think they're going to be super successful. Yeah, def- definitely an interesting uh, project. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that they were able to come on the show. I, I, yeah. I've always looked at ICOs, and I felt like maybe there'd be a nice addition to add like some sort of clause where there's you know, a few key holders that, you know, when the project needs fund, they have to get approval from, uh, you know, certain predetermined predetermined entities. Do any of your uh, Ether Party contracts have that or any of the uh, ICOs yeah. that you've worked with have that sort of clause where there's, you know, uh, where, P, where the 
funders have to, or the people have to get approval to actually have the funds released to them? Yeah, um, EtherParty can create escrow and, and multi-signature uh, contracts. It can, and we have worked. So Spells of Genesis is an example of a company that we did uh, milestone-based escrow with. It's it's not as traditional now, um, but I think it's, it's something that's really important, especially for for say newer companies that aren't in the space that that aren't aren't trusted to do that. It's actually something that has been brought up by our, our lawyers and our legal team that. In the future, they might want to do escrow not just with the companies and people in this industry, but escrows with the lawyer and the Securities Commission to make sure that companies meet this. It's not something that's been done yet, but it is something that's been talked about. Not sure how well that's going to go off. We're, we're doing something in our pre-sale, actually, that's a legal agreement between our company and, uh, and, and token contributors or purchasers, which is called a safe note, a simple agreement for future tokens. But it's a legally binding contract. That means that we have to meet our obligation to distribute these tokens to um, the companies. Because we already have a working product, we're much further, and we've been in the space since 2013, we're much further along than, than most people um, in this space. So our lawyers felt that the SAFT route was uh, a much safer way to go. Hmm. Yeah, Spells of Genesis you brought up, I haven't uh, heard too much about them lately, but certainly an interesting yeah. project. They kind of have you know, these uh, cards or trading cards that you can um, yeah. uh, you know, use in between games. So it's, you have this asset that you know, is tied to a, to a blockchain. Uh, tied in the blockchain to a particular address, and then you can kind of like build a game around these cards that already exist. I, I find that find that really interesting. Yeah, yeah, great company, great group of people. Yeah, you know, they have experience in the gaming space with their first game, Ma uh, Magic: The Gathering, and you know, just gaming and blockchain technology just kind of seems going hand in hand. I personally, myself, am not a gamer. I find the interest uh, the industry fascinating and just growing. We get a ton of gaming companies. Actually, one of our new clients um, is, a, is a very well-established gaming company called Engine that uh, we're helping them move into the, to the blockchain space and eventually they'll do an ICO as well. Um, uh, just recently uh, uh, a, group, a group out of Nintendo has come to us oh, really? um, to work with them on a space. So gaming and blockchain is, is really, really uh, booming. Yeah. Nintendo themselves or... Sorry, you cut out there. Uh, Nintendo themselves or... Oh, yeah, we're talking for a group that does like a Nintendo game publishing, Switch game, Nintendo Switch games, things like that. Uh, really early stages right now, so can't really go too too much in detail. But super interesting. We get approached by esports all the time, um, which is fascinating to me that you have like tens of thousands of people watching teams or people play a video game against each other. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's uh, weird. And like South Korea, there's, it's, it's like as big as football is in the States, you know, yes. it is, it is the, it is the sport, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not so, I mean, I find it all super fascinating and uh, looking forward to kind of work with a lot of these companies and build out new technologies and, and see how it all evolves. Uh, really exciting. I wanted to hear a little bit more about uh, Right Mesh and Burst IQ. Sure. So two new companies. So Burst IQ, um, really interesting company in the medical space. They, they're, they're an established company with established contracts. Um, based on medical data that's going to be using the blockchain um, to kind of handle medical data, transfer medical data. And, um, yeah, so they're kind of in the process of what building. What blockchain, when you say using the blockchain? It, it... So it's, it's Ethereum-based technology. Okay. So like a private, yeah. private Ethereum? Uh, not, yet. not yet. No, no, no. Their smart contracts are, are, are going to be public. Um, so we're working with them on all that. It's a it's kind of an existing business model in the space. Um, yeah, I can definitely forward you guys along some information on Burst. Might want to have them on the, on the show, actually. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, so Burst is super interesting in, in, the, in the medical space that we're working with, um, just kind of going through the process now. So when we work with a company... Um, we spend months kind of building everything up, doing due diligence, helping them to build things like their white paper, the, anything outward facing, memorandums, information, so it, it speaks to the blockchain space. So it, it takes some time um, with all of our clients before we actually 
we actually launch, launch them. And Mesh, the Right Mesh, is a new company that just we just started with um, a little over a month ago. They they actually come from an existing company called Left uh, Left dot io, which is an existing company in the in the digital space and travel space and everything. But they've developed uh, mesh, mesh networking technology based on Ethereum. So um, really cool, and I'm still just learning about all their technology, but they, they have nodes that if you're kind of running one of their nodes, you get uh, incentivized to do so, and people can kind of share your data, share your airtime, and everything, so you don't actually need to be connected to, say, your provider. Hmm. Kind of like, yeah, like how the old walkie-talkies and stuff used to work. They have a really great team. Um, really interesting space that 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 they're in. Uh, just new, so you're going to hear a lot about them kind of coming coming up. Is there any uh, technologies or projects in the space that uh, you aren't involved in, or your company isn't involved in, that uh, really has your interest as well? Hmm. I mean, it's tough to say. We we are in a lot of spaces. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think. AI and IoT is super interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, and uh, another one is virtual reality. Uh, but we are kind of in, in, in the virtual reality space with some companies here in Vancouver that we consult with and everything. But I'd say virtual reality, AI, and IoT are, are three really upcoming spaces that I'd love to get into. Really appreciate the... Um, uh, the way that this interview has gone, and everything really good. And you know, if you guys want access to any of our clients, or if there's someone in the space you want to talk to that we can connect you to, um, you know, let me know because um, we're pretty well in deep in, in this industry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Definitely, we'll have to do that. Uh, thanks again for coming on the show. It's been a very interesting interview, very knowledgeable about the space, the history of it, and uh, it's been it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Kevin. Really appreciate it, and happy to come back anytime. All right, thanks, Kevin. The Blockchain Show is a team effort by Steve Anderson, Heather Sullivan, Ethan Kinderconnect, and Sarah Hempling. To learn more, visit theblockchainshow.com. Are you looking for an easy way to buy Bitcoin or Ether on a safe, secure platform? Coinbase is the easiest place to buy and sell digital currencies. Sign up today as a friend of the Blockchain Show, and if you buy or sell $100 of Bitcoin or more, you'll earn $10 of free Bitcoin for yourself and $10 of Bitcoin to support this show. Join now using the link in this episode's show notes at theblockchainshow.com.